This property at Mooney, 370 kilometres west of Brisbane, was a cattle property. It took just a couple of years and one drought for cattle to become a sideline. Goats are now the main game. We never planned. We actually became accidental goat farmers and processors. Yeah, I didn't think it it had come to the, where it is now. Graziers Keeley and Brian Allport now run 30,000 goats. Every Monday, goats are mustered, drafted, weighed and loaded. Most of them are going to be about that 33 kilos. Up to 600 a week are trucked to an abattoir near Brisbane with the meat all destined for Australian butchers. <laughs> With two properties, their own transport, refrigeration and delivery trucks, and a processing facility, the only part of the supply chain they don't own is the abattoir. We have a vertically integrated supply chain, so we're really involved with every step and process, right from the farm through to the customer. We can guarantee that if you want a thousand, we can give you a thousand on that day. We have the stock, we can't, oh no, can you wait three weeks? We don't believe that's the right way to trade. Very good job, actually, to have a system like grassland and consistency and the way they invested in the business, it's, it's a great, it's a great successful Australian business. The Allports, very nicely, blame Landline for the switch out of cattle after Brian saw a story on wild goat harvesting in Western Queensland. You don't just let them sort of hang around in the paddock and maybe disappear to the neighbours. If you see goats now, you go and get them no matter who you are. You wouldn't walk past a $10 note on the ground, so why would I leave a, a $10 goat in the paddock? I guess that got us thinking a little bit and it ticked off then, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's uh, evolved from that thought of goats and wild harvest and why can't we farm these things? The Allport started with 1,200 feral or rangeland goats five years ago. They weren't bought primarily for meat, but as pasture renovators to eat weeds and regrowth so bush which had become too thick for cattle to graze could be opened up. They've got a handle on mustering goats now, but Keely and Brian found out the hard way goats are not like cattle. They're very very flighty. Yeah, yeah. And it's a safety thing. We had 1,200 goats in about 800 acres, 1,000 acre paddock. Yeah, acres, yeah. And we thought, well, you know, if they're anything like cattle, it'll just take us an hour or something. It took us three days. And we had really had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> They've been nipping the top of it. So they're going to, those pair have sort of stayed at that height. You can see some fresh growth there, and the goat will come through, and he'll just nip away at that. and and have a bit of a snack as part of his diet, so he mixes it all up with the browse. The goats impressed Brian with how well they co-grazed with cattle. With a diet 70% weeds, shrubs and tree leaves, the goats left grass for the cattle and were lighter on the land. They don't go and hammer one area of the paddock. They run their own feed program. They'll work one week, you'll see them in one end of the paddock, then they'll go work another end, and then they'll go down to another area and they just spread it. It's not getting all hammered at once. Yeah, it's a flog. Yeah, and that's why we've got this ground cover, um, dry feed still there. If it was blowing, you know, 30 or 40 kilometres an hour today, we'd have puffs of dust, dust coming, rolling off these paddocks because we're on a bit of a ridge. It would blow through here. We've got none of that. And even at a 100 kilometre wind, we would have very little wind erosion here, so. Saving your soil? Saving our soil, yeah, yeah. But if we can have this much ground cover this early in the season, we're a long way in front. The goat's performance during the last drought sealed it for the Allports. They were all in. When we sold our cows, we actually bought more goats in the middle of a raging drought. It was quite a bizarre thing, and I think some nights Keely thought I was right and mad, but um, the money we got for our cows, we reinvested into more goats and more fencing, and we just kept opening paddocks up because we just really believed that this was the right way to go. And I think if we didn't have the goats, um, we probably wouldn't be here, here where we are today. I don't think we would have come out of the drought as well. It was a huge risk and it's paid off. And yeah, we're just very fortunate about that. An avowed cattleman, Brian started to wonder if by managing goats like cattle, 
he could improve the sporadic wild harvest export business model. So as with their cattle, they bought better genetics, crossing stud meat breeds with the hardy bush ferals. So predominantly we're using boar goats and Kalahari, so we're using that composite to get better yields. Those first crosses, what are they like? When we're looking at a bush goat on the hook, we're probably looking at a 40 to 45% um, yield percentage. When we're crossing them with a, a boar goat or a Kalahari to get that hybrid vigour, we're probably looking at um, a 54 to 58% um, yield return. The offspring are more fertile, reach slaughter weights earlier and are better mothers. Traditionally, feral goats range across multiple land holdings, but the Allport's dog-fenced boundary can contain the wiliest feral Houdinis. Like cattle, they're run in paddocks, and like cattle, there's a feed plan, a mix of weeds, shrubs, grass and grain. So they'll go onto a grain ration and they'll just add lib as they want. So not everybody will eat it. Um, but they'll, yeah, the major percentage will go onto it and, um, and do well. Hay and grain for the goats is grown on farm. This flock is grazing a wheat crop badly impacted by the dry winter. We would have harvested it and that would have been fed back through the goats in a ration. But as you can see, it's a bit light on, but we're getting a lot of value out of this. It's a mini silage feedlot at the moment, so the weight gains would be amazing at the moment. Superior genetics and nutrition has improved meat quality, allowing the all ports to target, if not pioneer, a new premium market. We've all at some stage in our childhood had experiences of goat and it was tough and it wasn't very, uh, a very favourable thing to eat, but um, with genetics now um, and uh, nutrition programs, it's, it's actually a really nice little article now. Our big focus is our meat bone ratio. So you've got a lot of meat on that animal rather than just a skinny goat. So these guys are doing their 300 grams a day. Keely and Brian can no longer breed all they need. Remember the goats being loaded onto the truck? They were raised by approved suppliers, using breeds the all ports want. The genetics aren't quite there yet, though. Bush goats have many attributes, but one negative is their horns. So the all ports are using polled or hornless genetics over the bush goats to increase the number of offspring without horns. It's good for the goats, it's good for the people working with the goats, and I'm told boy goats without horns don't spend as much time fighting. No! Initially, Brian and Keeley thought they'd do what most goat people do and export them. The closest export abattoir in Victoria was too far away. So they focused on the underserved domestic market with a migrant customer base. In the Brisbane suburb of Underwood is one of Mabrook Hawuchia's three butcher shops. In the past, his suppliers and supplies have come and gone. Now Mabrook gets a delivery once a week. We used to sell 20 goats a week, now we are actually doing up to 130 a week, goats a week. Our customers are actually from a few ethnic groups in the halal and the Muslim community, and they can tell the difference of the consistency of the grassland goats compared to the other goats. Mabrook says domestic demand is growing. The all ports, though, are up against it, convincing more people to try goat. People don't know where to buy it from. I think there's low levels of confidence in preparing and, and cooking goat as well, and season variability. You know, the bush goats from out west, the quality is inconsistent throughout the year. The goat is sold diced, bone in. It's done at a small country butchery owned by the Allports. The recovery rate is an incredible 95%. Little is wasted. They plan to double production and increase sales to other states. To do that, they'll need to increase the flock from 30 to 50,000 and truck 1,000 animals a week. They'll need more land. So in February, they bought 10,000 hectares at Gore in the Southern Downs. Hey. Does this give you the opportunity to expand? Definitely, yes. 
So um, with, with this area here, we're treating it mainly for the breeding side. Um, and that's why we have the, um, the boar and Kalahari goats behind us. They're our breeding stock. Um, so then we can move them between this property and our finishing property at Mooney. Now you're never going to not need those bush goats, are you? Never. They're a very important part of our whole operation. The benefit of a bush goat is they will walk for water. They survive well in drought conditions. And we need that foraging part of their nutrition and herding as well. They've just declared an El Nino. How are you two feeling about that? We're not worried at all because goats excel in dry climate. You know, that's their natural environment. A little bit of rain through that dry period would be helpful. We do have reasonably good water supply on farm, so we're not too worried. Export plans aren't dead, just on hold until a small stock export abattoir is built in the region. That could be a few years, but they're not worried as they've barely touched the domestic market. You there, Brian? Yeah. One thing is clear to Brian and Keeley. Goats are not an emerging industry anymore. Hi, buddy.